Thank you all for being here today. My name is Andrew Gacho, and I'm currently a Peter Buck Postdoctoral Fellow, um, advised by Kevin DeCuros and Mike Braun. And today I'll be talking about the mysterious mid-peninsular break of Baja California, Mexico. Most of what I'll be talking about is from my dissertation research, which I finished last year, but this is currently um, a project I'm still working on here at the museum. So this research falls within a field called comparative phylogeography. And a key question within this field is, are ecological communities structured by shared biogeographic history, that is vicariants, or by idiosyncratic species-specific events, such as dispersal? And this question is chiefly of interest to evolutionary biologists, biogeographers, and conservation biologists. So first, I'm going to define a couple terms that I'll be using throughout the talk, vicariance and dispersal both of which can result in speciation or the evolution of new species. Under a vicariant scenario, we have an ancestral population symbolized by this blue oval. And at some point in time, a barrier develops to fragment this population. This barrier could be something like a river, a mountain range, or a seaway. And given enough time and isolation, the populations on either side of the geographic barrier will eventually evolve into dis distinct species. By contrast, under a dispersal scenario, we have an ancestral population that exists on one side of a barrier. At some point in time, a small fraction of that population, maybe even one or two individuals, may disperse across that barrier to found a new population. And at some point, that population will again evolve into a new species. So the end result is the same, but the mechanism by which we get there is different. Now, Baja California, Mexico is really an ideal place to study these kind of questions, and I think of it as a natural laboratory of speciation. It's rugged, isolated, and sparsely populated, and over the past six million years, it rifted apart from mainland Mexico along the San Andreas Fault System. This geographic isolation has resulted in the evolution of numerous endemic species found nowhere else in the world. So people have been interested in the historical biogeography of Baja California for quite some time. Jay Savage, in 1960, published a paper in which uh, he hypothesized that during the Pliocene and Pleistocene, uh, the reptiles and amphibians of the peninsula dispersed from north to south, and during the Pleistocene and Holocene interglacial periods, they dispersed from south to north. This is a hypothesis that was conceived before plate tectonics, before we knew that the peninsula was formally connected to the mainland. Some predictions of these hypotheses are that we'd expect to see nested phylogeographic patterns so that descendant populations are more deeply nested than ancestral populations along the axis of range expansion. We might also expect to see heterozygosity gradients so that uh, populations in the ancestral range have higher heterozygosity or genetic diversity than those in recently colonized areas. And finally, we might expect to see non-simultaneous or idiosyncratic divergence times across co-distributed taxa. By contrast, the mid-peninsular seaway hypothesis, or the simultaneous vicariance hypothesis, is based on the hypothesis that sea, um, higher sea levels during Miocene and Pliocene fragmented the peninsula into an archipelago of islands. Although there's no direct supporting geological evidence that seaway ever completely bisected the peninsula, um, this is based on the observation of spatially concordant genetic breaks for a wide variety of taxa, including reptiles, mammals, birds, fish, and invertebrates, both terrestrial and marine. Many of these breaks occur where the red line is shown on the map um, in the Vizcaino Desert. And a prediction of this hypothesis is that we would expect to see simultaneous divergence times for multiple co-distributed taxa if they all responded in the same way to uh, a seaway event. So this brings me to the research questions I'll be addressing. First, did the lizards included in this study simultaneously diverge across the Vizcano Desert due to vicariance from a seaway? Or did multiple idiosyncratic episodes of dispersal across a landscape matrix shaped by tectonic and climatic factors produce the observed genetic patterns? Oops. So the first group of lizards I looked at are the zebra-tailed lizards, genus Calosaurus, of which there are six subspecies distributed throughout the peninsula and offshore islands. I also looked at the banded rock lizards, Petrosaurus, of which there are four species. 
Brush lizards, genus Eurosaurus, of which there are three species, and spiny lizards, Scoloporus, of which there are five species in two different complexes that both range along the length of the peninsula. And for the methods, just real briefly, I sampled uh, 228 lizards that we collected in Baja California and eight islands in the Gulf of California. And uh, we extracted DNA from all these and used restriction-associated DNA sequencing to do uh, genomic libraries that were then sequenced on an Illumina HiSeq. And then I used a molecular clock approach to estimate divergence times for all these different groups across the Vizcano Desert. And basically what we found for the molecular clock results is that the divergence times were um, spread out quite a bit so that Petrosaurus was the youngest divergence of only 0.7 million years, whereas the Scoloporus Magister complex had a div mean divergence date of 2.91 million years. And when we compare the 95% confidence intervals for these dates, we can infer that at least three waves of divergence are required to explain this. Thus, we can reject the simultaneous vicariance hypothesis. Similarly, for latitude versus heterozygosity, it's probably a little bit hard to see these plots, but on the x-axis is latitude, and on the y-axis is heterozygosity, another measure of genetic diversity. And basically, we find that for Calosaurus, there's a significant positive relationship. For Scoloporus, there's no relationship. And for Eurosaurus and Petrosaurus, there's a significant negative relationship. So these patterns seem to be idiosyncratic, and the different genera seem to be responding in different ways. So in conclusion, um, I've concluded that idiosyncratic dispersal is the best supported hypothesis at this time. And for now, we can reject the simultaneous vicariance hypothesis, which also has been criticized based on the geological literature. However, some major caveats are is that um, I assumed a single mutation rate for all these taxa, which may be an incorrect assumption. So this is something I plan to test later this year with a target enrichment approach that will allow me to calibrate my trees with fossil data and get a better uh, molecular clock estimate. So this is still an ongoing project, and the final answer isn't quite here yet. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. The question is, uh, why would uh, the seaway affect all species simultaneously? Um, I guess the way I visualize this model is, you know, that you have a peninsula with species distributed along the length of it, the seaway rises, and so all the populations are fragmented more or less at the same time, at least in a geological time scale. Now, I mean, there's probably, like you said, as the sea is rising and dropping, there's maybe a little bit of variance around that, but given the width of the confidence intervals, we'd at least expect to see overlap in those confidence intervals. Um, I became interested in lizards in high school and I kept them as pets, um, which is sort of my truthful answer and I just think they're very beautiful and amazing creatures. But also part of it is that uh, lizards are widely distributed around the world and they're very diverse and they're um, specifically adap adapted to their environment. So they seem to be very ideal organisms for studying biogeography. Yeah, so the question is about the Isthmus of Panama, which is a classic uh, vicariance situation for marine organisms as the Isthmus form, then uh, populations on either side were fragmented. Uh, I think it may be a little bit different because from what I've read about the Isthmus is that, you know, it gradually closed and there's an archipelago and, you know, so some species that are more deep water specialists, for, in for, for example, may have um, been isolated earlier than those who, which live in shallow water habitats. Um, in this case, given that all the lizards are terrestrial and the seaway is probably, you know, not good habitat for any of them, I'm not really, 
I'd have to think about that a little bit more, but I, I would expect to see simultaneous, you know, over a time scale of maybe several hundred thousand years. Um, the, the other possibility is, too, that the sea levels may have risen and fallen multiple times, but um, that should have been during the Miocene and Pliocene, and some of those divergent states fell in the Pleistocene when we know the sea levels were lower. So I don't think that really um, matches well, but that's a, good, that's a good question. I'd have to think about that a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, June? Uh, the question is, how clock-like is the RADSEQ data? Um, that was that kind of major assumption or caveat that I talked about at the end, where I basically assumed, um, I basically assumed the same rate for all of the lizards in the study, and I did assume a relaxed log-normal clock, which allows for some rate variation. But that's kind of what I'm working on right now in the lab: is getting the target enrichment data. Um, with that data. Um, for a variety of reasons, which I don't really have time to go into, it's better suited to be calibrated with the fossil record. So I think once I get this next data set, I'll be able to really address that more carefully. No, even for your existing data, because I have been wondering, since the rat is sick, if you are looking across the entire genome, it should be as clock-like as possible, right? So that I'm looking at, I'm thinking about your system in your practical data, do you see major branch uh, differences across uh, among the system units? Major branch differences? Right. Yeah. If you look at system unit A versus B, do you see major difference between the branches? Um, I, I don't think so. I haven't done an explicit test to examine that to really see how clock like they are, which is probably a good. I mean, no one has done it. I would think mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that I've noticed. I mean, I've noticed overall the tree structures look pretty similar across the different groups. Of course, there are the different patterns in terms of some are more nested south to north and others are nested north to south. I wish I had time to show the trees, but I had to cut those out. <laughs>